And the third one is that an error in logical typing is committed and a game without end is established. In other words, action is taken at the wrong level. That's the one that's the most elusive and most complicated, although people do mishandle problems in the other two ways as well. What date is that? Pardon? Of, of what? Of the last one. Of the, an error in logical typing? Yeah. Well, j just uh, when, when you are, uh, for instance, if you are, well, all of the examples I've been giving are examples of, of addressing the member of a class, the members of a class, rather than the class itself. But I don't want to go into any more detail because I want to, to hear a little cognitive strain going on when we come back from the break. And I get you buzzing to see if you can't uh, pick a problem, a real problem that you're facing. And, uh, that you could, the four of you could mutually agree upon and brainstorm it this way and see what you come up with. Okay, we'll take a break. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Change is applied to what in the first order change perspective appears to be a solution. Because in the second order change perspective, the solution reveals itself to be the keystone of the problem. And that's, the, I mean, we, we went through that where what you're trying to do, like the guy who's trying to get himself to sleep, his effort to get himself to sleep. <coughs> well, here's another one. I just counseled somebody recently. They have, are so attracted to somebody <coughs> that they're bugging the daylights out of him. And so he's making himself scarce. So the person is calling up even more frequently, which is making him even more scarce. So her solution, which is to try to get more contact with him, is in fact becoming the problem. You see what's happening? That often doesn't. If you want, some, if you want to hold somebody close to you, let them be free. Because if you clutch them, they'll feel suffocated and they'll try to get out, they'll try to get away. It's the hardest thing to do, really. And you know, I, I've noticed with my own babies, I have to be very careful because I understand why, why my mother hamster ate the baby hamsters. You know, I love my babies so much that I could just eat them. And I always say that the only reason I don't is I don't know whether to begin with their nose or their toes. And I just want to hold my babies for a long time. And if you do that, pretty soon they don't want to be held by you. You know, they'll push you away. So you have to discipline yourself to, to, to hold them very loosely. In fact, non-cuddly babies need to be given a lot of room and time. And the problem is that a mother who's just had a baby wants to cuddle. If this is a non-cuddly baby, her, you, her way to handle that problem is to hold him even tighter, to, to show him how much she loves him, which makes him hate it even more. He was already suspicious of cuddling. Now his suspicions have been mightily confirmed. See? So we often have these things in, in, in human affairs. First order change always appears to be based on common sense. That's where you think the problem is. but you usually get more of the same when you operate on the level. Second order change usually appears slightly weird, <coughs> unexpected, and maybe uncommonsensical, if not nonsensical. There is a kind of puzzling, paradoxical element in the process of change, until, of course, you now see it from the other perspective, and then you can understand it. Applying second order change techniques to the solution that was making your, your problem the problem, means that the situation is dealt with in the here and now. And it deals with effects and not their presumed causes. I haven't 
really assimilate the law <coughs> because I don't think it applies right across the board. Use of second order change lifts the situation out of the paradox engendering trap, placing it in a different frame, just like the nine dot problem. Now, I want to give you one example that I know one or two of you have to read, and I want you to hear this example because I think it's very instructive. And then uh, I want to just have you do a little brainstorming and see how you do it. Um, this is an actual case that they report in the book of uh, a couple coming for marriage counseling um, over a problem that they had for a long time. And it, it was the problem of the wife losing progressively greater amounts of respect for her husband because he would not do anything to stop the increasing interference on the part of his parents. He was an only child. <coughs> he was very successful. They put him through law school. They gave him everything. And in fact, they weren't all that comfortable having him marry her. And she picked out a small house and wanted a modest place. And they said, no, you've got to have something better than that. Move them to another part of town, bought them a bigger house. And the mother came in and said, well, you don't want dark carpets. You want light carpets. And, and said, we'll pay for it. And she picked out the drapes and everything. And this had been going on for a long time. And they came to stay four times a year for three weeks each time. <laughs> and the Mary, every time that as the three weeks ap approached, tensions would mount. And then after they went, there was always an explosion. And when they came, it was the same thing. He would go out in the garage and tidy up the garage, get the lawn or out and mow the lawn. She'd come in and redo the kitchen. She'd say, well, these forks don't belong here. They should go over here. And she'd go out and buy all new groceries. She'd defrost the fridge. And she'd cook the meals. And, um, and, and then they would run around saying, oh, mom, don't do this. And he'd say, oh, dad, don't do that. And they'd run around and try to help. And then if they would take them out for dinner. They'd always pay the bill. And she wanted him to stand up and say, look, this is our life, and we're the hosts, and so on. And he would do it because his notion of a good son was not to hurt his parents' feeling. And the parents' notion of good parents was to lavish gifts on their son and provide him the things he needed. And they were stuck in that system of thought. And so yeah, they got to quarreling and fighting about it every time. And so it was, she just now reached the point where she said, this is it for me. Either you say out with them, or you can only stay two days, and we're going to cook the meal. And because everything they tried, they tried everything. Actually, it was just shuffling around within the system, and there was no real change. They were trying first order change. So and they came for therapy, and it was just before the parents were planning to come for another three weeks in. So they said, they prescribed the roles of the two. They're going to jump out of a system now, on one level at least. They're going to keep the idea that th these parents were good parents, and they would not want to do anything to undermine or spoil or whatever, children. But they have made the, the, the two people jump out of the system by stopping running around, trying to say, oh, no, don't do that. He said, OK, for the next three weeks, you're not to do this. You're not to wash a dish. You're not to wash any clothes at all. You're not to vacuum the rug. You're not to mow the lawn. You're not to rake the leaves. You're not to do anything. Just let the house go to rack and ruin. And then when the parents come, of course, they're going to be slightly shocked to see this. And they said the, uh, the role they prescribed the son was really interesting because they said, now, when your dad comes in and says, you know, he's going to go out and do the car, you say, oh, gee, thanks, dad. And you immediately flop down on the couch, open up a can of beer, and start reading your favorite magazine. And every, every time you get up for another can of beer, you poke your head out and say, how's it going, Dad? And then you plop down on the couch <laughs> and put your feet up. And the girl is supposed to say, oh, Mom, I'm glad you're here. I've got some friends I need to go see. And you clean up the kitchen and be terrific. And I won't be 
home in order in time to make the meal. Maybe you can have that ready too. It'd be terrific. I really appreciate it. Watch you in. Well, they had agreed on beforehand that the criterion for the success of this therapy would be an actual verbal statement on the part of one of the parents that they were not going to come and stay with them anymore for such long periods. And certainly, they are not going to continue to be exploited in this fashion. <laughs> so, and that's a pretty solid criterion, you know, you didn't actually say that. So, the parents came. And the scene unfolded just like you might think. The mother rolled up her sleeves and started doing this. And the wife came down, all with the gloves on, ready to go out for the day. And, and the guy was sloppy in his shorts, and he plopped down on the couch with his can of beer. <laughs> and the father was out there huffing and puffing, and morning he came in and saw his son there. They didn't last two days. Came on Friday night and Sunday morning they were already packed. They came down and even stayed for breakfast, I think. And they, the son said, "We have to have a." The father said, "Son, we have to have a frank talk." He said, "Quite honestly, your mother and I are very distressed with the behavior around here. <laughs> Things have been going to rack and ruin the kitchen." So he said, "We are not going to come here and clean up this place for you anymore. <laughs> it is not right. We would be spoiling you. It would be wrong of us as your parents." to uh, uh, let you get by with this. Who's there for you? Pardon? <laughs> Who's there for you about this? <laughs> well, actually, did they say in the book that the, the husband was very reluctant to try this. However, the wife was thrilled with, <laughs> with the whole idea of the approach because she had a lot of hostility she needed to get rid of it. So it, it was a double function for her. She enjoyed every minute of it. And the fact that it worked was just frosting on the cake. So. Here's a case where you, you work the system in such a way that the parents didn't lose anything in terms of the way they saw how good parents ought to behave. But the, the son and the daughter had to, they were, the, they were part of the problem, you see, by the way they were reacting. That became the problem and it was a game with no end. They jumped out of that system. And that called a halt for the whole thing. And I, I suspect that the, the most difficult thing for human beings to recognize is when they are a part of the problem, when they see themselves as the solution. It happens time and time again. Well, you had another one. What? You had two? <laughs> well, and there are a whole lot of them in there. Let me see if I, uh, yeah, I can't think. Yeah, you think it would be useful to put the book inside. People want to know. Would you like the reference? We have it in the office. Let me just go get the book and I'll show it to you. If you do, you don't need to have time. by Norton. <clears throat> 74. 74. I'm so irritated I didn't find it in 74. But, um, <coughs> they, uh, I, there was a lot I didn't uh, <coughs> For instance, um, they, give, they give typical types. Let me just give you an example. Making the overt the covert. See, sometimes your problem is that, that you are keeping something covered. 
it should be overt. They say advertising instead of concealing. Sometimes the problem is that things are concealed when they in fact they should be advertised. Um, and they give some uh, precise cases for it. Here, let me just read something to you. An experienced intelligent executive assistant, accustomed to making her own decision, was having difficulties with one of her bosses. Judging from her own description of the conflict, this man was apparently both annoyed and made to feel insecure by her independent and rather forceful modus operandi, and in turn missed few opportunities for putting her down, especially in the presence of third parties. She felt so offended by this that she tended to adopt an even more distant and condescending attitude towards him, to which he then reacted with more of the same. Belitt same belittling, which had made her angry in the first place. The situation escalated to the point where he apparently was about to recommend her transfer or dismissal, and she was considering outdoing him by resigning first. <laughs> well, you know, this goes on and on. Without, ex without explaining to her the underlying reasons, when she came into, she got through distress, she came for therapy. Without explaining to her the underlying reasons, we instructed her to wait for the next incident and then to utilize the first opportunity of taking her boss aside and telling him with an obvious show of embarrassment something to the effect that, I have wanted to tell you this for a long time, but I don't know quite how to tell you. It's a crazy thing, but when you treat me as you just did, it really turns me on. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it has something to do with my father. And then you should leave the room quickly before he can think of anything to say. <laughs> of course, she was at first horrified and then intrigued. And finally, she found the whole idea enormously funny. And she said she could hardly wait to try it out. But when she came back for her next appointment, she stated that the, that the very next morning, her boss's behavior had somehow changed overnight and that he had been polite and easy to get along with her ever since. Actually, what happened, just her thought of doing that to him, when she was getting ready to do it the next morning, changed her attitude. And he just reacted another way. If proof were needed for the fact that reality is what we have to come to, have come to call reality, this form of change could help to supply. Strictly and concretely speaking, nothing had really changed in the sense that no explicit communication or action had taken place. But what makes this form of problem solving effective is the knowledge that one can now deal differently with a previously threatening situation. And once you know you can deal with it differently, you are different, even though you haven't tried it out. And that takes care of the problem. So they have a lot of uh, very interesting uh, concrete examples taken from their therapy. And, all, and most of them turn out to be slightly on the funny side because you are doing what you think really should not be done at all. Because it really takes you out of what you would ordinarily think of in that common sense point of view. Anyway, one of the things that uh, George is working on in his dissertation is how to I'll see you later, give you a call in depth is um, how we are going to create an evaluation system for the ANISA model, which is based on a totally different set of premises about human beings and where they're going, and which does not fit into the mechanistic view of things. See, we're not interested in how people fit into the normal curve. We are interested in their unique capabilities, which we want to foster and draw out. We're interested in spotting their points of modifiability, in locating their points of maximum potentiality, and doing things to strengthen their uniqueness. And we're interested in not a little piece of information about them at one moment in time. We're interested in seeing how they change over time, and how the rates of change change, and how the rates of the change of the rates change. And those are the interesting things. And. Um, so we are, we are, we are, there are problems when you try to move into a system and change it, obviously. And uh, it just doesn't happen easily because people do not change their worldview easily and operate in a new set of premises. Because new categories of thought, our, our master's degree program that we have now at National University is really set up to give people systematic experience in nurturing and cultivating new perceptions of the way things are. 
by entertaining new categories of thought and acting from them habitually. So that when you're when you're with a person, they sense that they're now with something different. And uh, our thesis in Anisa is that when you establish a bond with a child, it is, it, the quality of that bond determines the degree of the child's teachability. And once that bond is really there, it's just amazing what can be done through that bond. That establishing that bond, however, depends upon looking at that child in quite a different way. And the whole educational system of Anissa is designed to help the child himself see creation and his relationship to it in a whole other way. See, one of the distinguishing features of human beings is their capacity to entertain possibilities. That's where creativity is. That, and that's what we call transcendence in the model, in part. Therefore, we think an enormous chunk of the curriculum ought to be organized around addressing the unique features that distinguish man from all other creatures in the universe, so far as we know. Including that one. Now, when you have a child that starts out live, and he is in the mode of entertaining possibilities, and that's where his thrill comes from, <coughs> then you create a new kind of human being by virtue of that orientation. Because you, you, you can per perpetually help that child face the unknowns in his life by an activation of faith, which is the only way you can approach an unknown. And the activation of faith it turns energy from anxiety, which I call energy without a goal, into a certain form of energy called courage, which enables you to face that. Well, now, when you've got things like this going in the curriculum, and I know you've all been exposed to bits of the model, but I know it, it comes and goes unless you're working with it on a daily basis. When you think of a whole system that's now operating on a new set of first principles, first principles that go down through the whole system and organize it in a coherent fashion so that teaching and administration and curriculum and evaluation and, and uh, everything are tied together in one piece. You have a totally different sort of environment. The question is, how do we evaluate that? Because normal distributions are not what we're interested in and where people fit on some curve. Yeah, that's, not, that's not our objective to make everybody the, the same. In fact, we would expect increasing differentiation in the population of such children, not making people more and more the same. We would let more and more of their genotype become actualized in a phenotype. Are you familiar with those words? You know, genotype refers to... I'll quit in a minute, I promise. Genotype is what you have inherited. It is the blueprint of you in the sperm and the egg, in the chromosomes of the sperm and the egg. However, you can never know what a genotype really is because the organism that holds it interacts with an environment. And when it interacts with that environment, then something else comes out, and that's what you actually see, and that's called a phenotype. For instance, we always thought that, they, that, that, that the genotype for stature for Japanese was short. But when the Japanese came here and went on an American diet, the phenotype changed. See, and they thought, well, the genotype was short, and the phenotype was short. But only if you stay in Japan on the Japanese diet. If you change the environment, you come over here, and you eat all that milk, cheese, butter, egg, steak, and french fries, or whatever, then you're six, six, six inches taller on the average. Now, there is every reason to suppose that 
there is enormous variability in our genotypes. We put them through an environment and try to make them all come out into similar phenotypes. How many Einsteins have you got in your classrooms? How many Picassos? How many Rubensteins? How many Nureyevs? You, you, you won't know because you are not focusing on trying to find the unique strengths and develop them fully. You're busy finding the one who is lagging behind trying to shore him up in that area to make him look normal, which means almost everybody is cramped, which is why nobody likes it. Now, I can't be taken, I mean, what I'm saying could be easily misunderstood because children resist doing certain things that they need to do. And I think, for instance, managing the language is so important because it's a window through which you can see the rest of the world so magnificently through other people's thoughts and adds richness. So to be deprived of that is, is foolish. On the other hand, uh, I think coming through, say, uh, a Massachusetts school system, I think the Massachusetts mandates 20 minutes of music a week whether you need it or not. That system is not going to awaken the musical genius in the state. <coughs> so we have to have a whole new evaluation system that takes into account the subjective aim and interests, intentions, and purposes and aspirations of the children. And then looks at what they accomplish in relationship to that. And not just in relationship to the aspirations of somebody else state law or whatever. So we're talking about a whole new way of organizing life for youngsters in schools. And we need a new system of evaluating it. Because the system we have now, this is the same system you would evaluate statistically, the, the quality of cars coming off the conveyor belt. After all, it was Horace Mann's idea, you know. He was not all that great an educator, in my opinion, seen from, from the Anisa point of view, because he took the industrial mode. He put things on a conveyor belt, you come through, you do this at this point, you do this at this point, this point, when they get here, you stamp a certificate on them, say they come through it all. That's the high school diploma. It won't work. And I think that the whole thing is going to break down in the next 50 years. People are going to use, they're just not going to put up with it anymore. It's too suppressive. We're going to have to be terrifically imaginative. Otherwise, the school system, which is now part of the problem, which society is hoping is going to be the solution, is going to give us more of the same, which will be the game without end. The attempt of Anissa is to jump out of that to the next level and deal with it from there by having a whole new set of first principles. Well, you got me on my soapbox. I have to come down off it now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Enjoy being with you. Oh, do you want to play? I'll play you a little piece. You know what I was going to do? I was going to show you how if you were a composer and you wanted to have some music that sounded different from all your contemporaries, what would you do? You see, almost all contemporary music is based on a scale. Say, well, I'll try another composition. So you put it. As long as you think in terms of that scale, you will get changes, but no, no. You shuffle the notes around, and you get a different composition, but it won't be a real change. So the thing to do is to think outside the scale. Now that's what Debussy did. 
he said, instead of using this uh, seven tone scale, I'm going to use a six tone whole tone scale. So he built a whole musical system on a whole tone scale. And it gave a whole new, the whole movement of French impressionistic music came in. So you think outside the system. In Bach's day, it was all contrapuntal. They thought every line had to be a melody. When the Romantists came along, they said, why do all the lines have to be a melody? Why can't some of the lines just go um pa pa um pa pa? Here's a little here's a little piece I composed for my daughter when she was eight months, sitting on my lap. Her name is Charlotte, so this piece is called Little Charlotte, and uh, it has words to it. But we we made up the, the piece while we we're sitting right here, and it's uh, it's based on the assumption that you have one line that's a melody and the other is um pa pa. on them, sort of screwing around, and they say, we get it clean, oh yes, we really do. Well, one, we were watching this television, and when those little brushes said that, she got the giggles. That somehow, that's, oh yes, yes, we really do. So, this little line here, it says, Charlotte, I love you. Oh yes, I really do. So she was grumpy. I'd... One day she came in, she was grumpy, and when I played this, it made her mad. She came over to, to me like this. And so I said, she was just still mad, so I changed it too. right away and she broke into smiles because it was just such a it's amazing how child she was just nine or nine or ten months old she could immediately see that you know she was being grumpy and there was no need to and when I turned the music around and matched it she was trying to be contrary well if she's going to be contrary to this she has to go back to that and we have variations she said faster dad she and she want she didn't want the waltz beat I could tell she didn't want the waltz because she wanted to run. So we had. 